This is a video for people who've come to my channel and seen me use something like this or like this, and you were asking yourself, how does this work? The grid and the arc are USB controllers. They're general purpose. They're not MIDI controllers. You can't plug it directly into a MIDI synthesizer. Um, that means that it requires a USB host and they're also bus powered. When you connect a device, Serial OSC spawns a little background server that can send and receive information to any application that's willing to listen. When you see a grid of buttons like we do on the Monom, it's reminiscent of the MPC-60, and so it might be um, convenient to think of it as like a descendant of those drum pads, but um, they're actually very different. The pads on a drum controller are rubberized, typically. They're velocity sensitive and they're bigger, whereas the buttons on the Monom are much smaller and they have a definite snap to it and they don't send velocity. On a grid, you press a button to generate a message and the buttons have this binary state, so three numbers are transmitted. The X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and the state of the button. So these three numbers are transmitted whenever you press a button on, on the Monom. The origin is in the upper left hand corner and increments uh, as you move right and then it also increments as you move down from the origin. So that's how you can get information from a Monom grid, but then the computer can also send a message to light up an LED on the Monom underneath those buttons. So you may have figured out that by itself the Monom does nothing. Like if you take a, a Monom grid and you plug it into your computer, uh, even though it's powered and still working, um, when you press a button, it doesn't actually do anything. There's no pre-programmed functionality. Um, the most obvious behavior would be like a field of momentaries where the lights or the LEDs light up the buttons when you press them. But in reality, that interaction isn't really worth much by itself. Like, um, the, <laughs> first of all, the, the LEDs are lighting underneath your fingers, so you can't really tell they're, they're actually lit. Also, the user interface in interaction is not that useful in and of itself. Decoupling allows us to create a whole bunch of different button gestures, like for example, a radio group where one button uh, lights up one LED and turns all the other uh, LEDs on that row off. Uh, you could create a bank of faders, um, a field of toggles, and incidentally, a field of toggles is the primary setup for um, a polyphonic grid sequencer. One of the things that makes Monom unique is the support for messages that allow you to light up an entire section of the Monom grid with a simple message. These messages are a lot more efficient, uh, so instead of setting the value of each LED individually with separate messages, you can send one message that sets the state of the entire quadrant on a grid. When you're using these efficient messages, then you could do things like combine the grid with the arc to create a scrolling field of data. The arc operates in a way similar to the grid. It sends and receives data, and those actions are decoupled. So that means that when I move this encoder clockwise, it sends positive increments, and when I move counterclockwise, it produces negative ones. It's very easy to use an accumulator to take all these ticks and sum them into an aggregate value that you can then use to send to a parameter somewhere. Each encoder on the Monom Arc is surrounded by 64 LEDs, and like the grid, you can send a single message to light up a single LED on the Arc. When I'm using the Arc, I typically end up using the map message, which allows me to set all the LEDs of the single encoder with one message. Potentiometers have a start point and an end point, and they're good for expressing bounded parameters. You can emulate bounded parameters on the arc by using the LEDs to indicate the start and stop points, and then overlay an indicator or a level uh, indicator or a bipolar value on top of that bounded value area. 
The arc has a resolution of 1,024 steps per revolution, and you probably don't go around memorizing what the typical resolution of encoders are on typical gear, but it's usually around 24 or 48. So this is an order of magnitude more resolution on the encoder, and it makes it suitable for a wider degree of applications, especially those involving some degree of musical performance and touch. The arc enables me to tailor the resolution of what I need to do to the application. So for example, if I need quick gestures, like uh, changing a filter with a quick gesture, I can use a low resolution mode for that. But I can also use high resolution if I want to listen to the beating of uh, two frequencies against each other. One of the advantages of using an encoder is to be able to express boundless values. One example of a boundless value would be rate, where you might want to express rate positively or negatively, but then go to infinity also in either direction, so you can navigate through zero and reverse your direction. So in this example, we have an LFO which is modulating the cutoff of a low-pass filter. The rate of the LFO is represented two ways, first as an absolute value with bounds, and then as an unbounded value where we display the output of the LFO on the LED ring itself. We can use 300 degrees of rotation for new kinds of interaction, like this bandwidth control. This example uses a sawtooth processed through a spectral filter. This spectral filter has 256 bands, and the amplitude of each one of those bands is expressed on the ring surrounding the first encoder. The encoders themselves are sending two parameters. There's two LFOs, rate and phase. So moving the phase control when the rate is zero seems to rotate the parameter it's currently mapped to, and when I change the rate control itself, it seems to make the rotation apply automatically. Yeah.